Good morning. Good morning. Well, you're quiet. Goodness. Uh, my name is Dean Smith, and I'm very pleased to be uh, the uh, one of the co-hosts. Uh, I am the North American uh, Waterfall Management Fund Director and Wildlife Liaison with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And on behalf of our president, Kurt Melcher uh, of Oregon, uh, I was very pleased to be a co-host of this event. Uh, <laughs> and I know there's a lot of uh, state fish and wildlife agency uh, folks here, so I'm uh, really glad to see that high level of participation. I'd like to take this time to also reiterate uh, Mike Afrito's uh, thanks to everyone involved in the conference. Uh, there's obviously a lot of people that uh, get involved in planning and organizing. And so uh, special thanks to Mike and to Ashley Bayer uh, for co-hosting the event. And thanks to the advisory board members, the sponsors, and to everyone here for choosing to spend time uh, in Fort Collins at the Pathways 2023 conference. I'd also like to thank all the folk, people from AFWA uh, that were involved in, in promoting this through our committee structure. I think that worked very well. And um, it's been great to be a partner in planning this event from the beginning. Now, I'd like to introduce our first plenary speaker of the day. And just um, we've used those cards before, we're not going to do that. We will have the roving mic for questions. So just you know, make a note of your question during uh, the talks. And uh, then Emily and Paul or one of the other volunteers will uh, come around and, and we'll be able to use the microphones for questions. So. Our first speaker is Dr. Alexandra Zimmerman. Uh, she specializes in human wildlife conflict, in particular conflict analysis, mediation, policy, and training. Alex is based uh, at the Wildlife Conservation Research, Research Unit, uh, Wild Crew, which is part of Oxford University's Department of Zoology. Dr. Zimmerman is also chair of the IUCN Human Wildlife Conflict and Coexistence Specialist, Specialist Group and Senior Advisor on Human Wildlife Conflict at the Global Wildlife Program at the World Bank. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alex Zimmerman for her talk entitled, Why We Need Conflict Resolution for the Future of Biodiversity Conservation. Dr. Zimmerman. Good morning. I am so impressed mm -hmm. to see all of you here at 8 a.m. in the morning. It's good to see you. Um, so, and thank you Dean, for the introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about conflict. Um, and I know that uh, that might look, uh, feel a little bit negative, but actually conflict can be an opportunity. And it is something that we simply have to deal with in conservation. So I'm going to focus on that. Um, so human wildlife conflict is something I've been working on for the last nearly 25 years, and we've been that very much on the human and the social side and the societal side of these issues. Um, and I know that in this, this forum, um, that is very familiar to many of you. So I'm going to try and delve into this in a little more detail. So what we have is a vision of the UN that we must live in harmony with nature. And this is important. It is Grand, it is blue sky, it is what we need to motivate us. It is absolutely crucial that we have these kinds of visions, the vision that we are to live in harmony with nature, with wildlife, and that all species, including humans, can benefit. That's wonderful. Um, that kind of positive frame is what keeps many of us going. However, um, I don't want to be the negative pessimistic one, but I think we have to deal with the fact that Right now, that is not the state that we're dealing with. There's an awful lot of disharmony in the world at every layer, um, and whether that is human wildlife conflict or just is inequalities, destruction of nature, everything. So, what I'm going to propose to you in these 20 minutes is that conflict resolution is something we have to deal with, like it or not. We have to tackle, this is one of the many elephants in the room we have to tackle. It is crucially important, it is urgent, and it is important for all of biodiversity conservation worldwide, whichever angle of it you're working on. So what are we talking about with sort of conflicts? Well, first of all, there's the classic kind of conflicts that come around protected areas. 
And now with the ambition to increase the, the area of protected areas, the 30 by 30 target, this is going to be even more of an issue. Anywhere you, where you have an edge between wildlands and people, there is always people around the protected area. You're going to have clashes over who gets to use that resource, who gets to live there. Issues around access and benefits and equities. These have to be tackled. Then you have very specific, very heated kinds of conflicts and conservation. Think about trophy hunting, hunting wildlife, and the kind of very inflamed situations that that creates. So I look at the slightly bewildered the debate that happens, for example, on social media around trophy hunting, where you have almost, it's almost binary. You have these two very polarized sides. You have a, you have a number of scientists who keep arguing that the evidence shows that uh, where you allow trophy hunting, communities are more likely not to shoot those animals themselves. Therefore, it is a logical thing to do. And then you have huge numbers of people who say, this is absolutely abhorrent to me. I cannot accept this. Animals must not be killed in this way. We do not accept your arrogance. We don't accept your evidence. And so this is not about anything rational. This is about emotions, it's values, it's beliefs. And, these, and I'm watching this, particularly on social media, it's becoming extremely polarized. And these two sides are not able they are not listening to each other at all. They're not hearing each other and they don't want to hear each other. They are shouting at each other. And so this is quite an extreme example. Then you have other kinds of con conflicts and conservation that are real true dilemmas. This image here is actually on the border of Myanmar and Bangladesh before the Manga crisis. There was a, the, the 2313 satellite image there. This was forested land. Then you had the refugee crisis, and uh, in this particular area, uh, 800,000 people settled into a sort of a refugee camp, popped up in a matter of months, and 800,000 people lived here now. Um, and this was an area where elephants used to wander through. There's a group of around uh, 40 elephants that still try to wander through this area, and what has happened is that they've wandered into the camp, 13 refugees have been killed, and so this presents you with really a dilemma. Who, whose side are you on? Or is there even a side? Or what do we do? There are two different <coughs> needs and clashes here. So again, these are biodiversity conflicts that are about a, a whole range of things. The needs, the needs of different parties and different actors and different viewpoints. And then we have wolves. And so wolves are the classic example of very deep-rooted complex conflicts and conservation. Those of you who work on wolves, and I believe there's quite a few and there's been some excellent sessions, there's one yesterday that really brought out the issues of this. These conflicts are not about wolves at all. As you know, these conflicts are about identity and politics and divisions, and they are about. I, and who you, who you are um, uh, identifying with. And a bit like the trophy hunting debate, this is absolutely parties no longer able to talk to each other is the complete breakdown. So the pattern that I'm trying to show here is that it is human nature to have conflicts. We always have. We have wars and quarrels and battles over everything. Um, that's not going to go away. But the point I'm trying to show here is that the solutions aren't going to be in data and rational um, uh, argument or technology or drones or anything like that. Unfortunately, messy as it is, human nature is all about values and beliefs and identities. And we have to get a whole lot better as an entire sector in understanding and managing these issues. And so one thing that strikes me quite a lot in conservation is that a lot of us come from a science background um, and kind of want to present evidence evidence to persuade others that this or that is the way to go about it. Um, and sometimes we are kind of focused on only one kind of evidence. So what I've seen, for example, in the hunting debates, or even in some human wildlife conflict situations, is that you have scientists present evidence that this species is endangered, and therefore this must be done, and here is the logic. And then they are baffled why this isn't getting across. And for example, you know, in, if you think of the trophy hunting discussion, well, there's a whole lot of evidence that that approach of throwing scientific evidence isn't working. 
and that's a different kind of evidence. So who's, who, whose evidence are you following here? And are you able to actually listen to different kinds? Okay, so I'm proposing that we've followed quite a big evolution in conservation. It started out in biology, firmly in biology and ecology, in the natural sciences. That has changed a lot. And these kinds of um, convenings like pathways have contributed to that hugely by bringing a number of social sciences into the system. So we now talk about conservation science, not so much biology. And so I'm proposing that there is a one piece that needs to be added to this kind of circle of, of disciplines that are involved in conservation science, and that is the whole area of conflict studies. And that involves peace building and negotiation, mediation, a whole range of things. And so I would uh, argue for adding a spike on that in there. Now, the more you delve into that field and you start to read the literature, it's actually quite overwhelming itself. And so sometimes we as conservationist scientists are simply overwhelmed by the number of things that we are supposed to know about and be experts in. So what I'm gonna try and do is talk a little bit about human wildlife conflict as a classic example of these conflicts, biodiversity conflicts, um, partly because it's what I know a little bit about, but partly also because I believe that when you have a human wildlife conflict, it is a red flag. It tells you that there are, that all is not well. It's kind of the canary in the coal mine that should be warning you if you have a heated human wildlife conflict, there's a whole lot more going on and it needs to be addressed. Plus human wildlife conflicts, the media jump on this um, in good and bad ways. That's another whole topic, but it gets attention and it could be a vehicle for us to turn these conflicts into an opportunity to learn and to actually transform some of these situations. So human wildlife conflict is a classic example of absolutely not being in harmony with nature. And it's an absolutely global challenge. I know for a fact that this is a challenge for every single country in the world. Um, and it's a huge range of species and a huge range of different kinds of people and communities. Just take elephants, for example. There are 37 range states in Africa and 13 in Asia. So one quarter of the world's countries have elephants. Every single country that has elephants has an issue with elephants and they are worrying about their human elephant conflicts. And what's interesting is it doesn't matter how many elephants they have. It can be Benin or Vietnam with a hundred or fewer elephants, or it can be uh, India or Botswana with tens of thousands. It doesn't matter. Elephants are very, very difficult to live with and very problematic, very political. And so um, they, of course, get the lion's share of, uh, of uh, attention as do all the carnivores, but there are so many other species involved as well. Now, what's um, interesting is that this issue has now popped up um, in the Global Biodiversity Framework, which uh, was of course signed off in COP15 in Montreal la or late last year. And our specialist group was heavily involved in trying to help parties get the wording right on this. And it, at this point, it doesn't even quite matter whether the wording is perfect, feel free to disagree. But the fact that this is explicitly mentioned in a UN treaty is extremely important. It means that all countries are acknowledging this as a serious issue and will need to do something about it. Um, so there we are. Now, what is human wildlife conflict? Well, it, it always involves some sort of interaction with between wildlife and people, that's the trigger. But the argument I always make, and I think to this audience is not gonna be difficult to convince you of, is that the conflict is among the people, frankly, right? So as I keep saying here, if we wanna tackle this, we need to understand these interactions, these conflicts between groups of people a whole lot better. And we need to learn very fast, either how to manage them ourselves or how to bring in people who know how to manage them. And that depends on the situation. So again, I don't wanna be the um, pessimistic one. I'm just focusing on conflict in this particular talk. Um, but the, the, the inconvenience of this is that these, these are complex systems, they're constantly changing. Um, it, we can't find quick fixes that you can just roll out everywhere. It doesn't work that way because these are social conflicts. Every case is different from the next. If you think about the same species in different areas, 
the nature of each situation is different. So we need unique tailored situations in each, in each location. Um, and they pretty much always have social conflict underneath. So let's go back to our elephant example. It's really quite um, interesting that you can have elephant conflicts that are very, very political and complex, say, for example, human elephant conflicts in Botswana. And then you can have elephant conflicts where conflicts with elephants that are um, really, if you can bring a practical solution to the issue, then it's okay. People will be all right with the, the more or less accept these, these animals around in their environment. They really just need security. Um, and so, so it's not about the species is what I'm trying to say. Um, and then you have your wolf kind of situations I think many of you are familiar with. And there was a great session on this yesterday morning showing how much of the discourse on this is people attacking each other. They're almost not even talking about wolves anymore. So why is it that we have this huge range? How do we begin to understand this huge range of, of um, types of conflicts and scenarios? So I would argue that all human wildlife conflicts are complicated, but, but some more so than others. And how do you know what's going on? So I'm gonna to revert to my favorite conceptual model, which some of you are probably familiar with, which basically thinks of conflicts over wildlife or any other biodiversity issues as a bit of an iceberg. You can see that there's trouble. There's something uh, at the surface, but there's a hell of a lot more going on underneath. And that is much more difficult to see, to understand, to figure out. But this is what absolutely is crucial because if you sail your conservation ship along and pretend there is nothing under the surface, you're not going to sail very far. Um, and as a whole, conservation is going to keep crashing into these hidden layers of conflict and, and not do very well. So let's take this. And how do you begin to figure out what you need to do? Well, I would just start with a very simple question. This is, I think, a guiding question that can always help is ask yourself in your project, in your program, in your organization, are you solving the right problem? If you ask yourself that, you open up a whole bunch of other questions and you open yourself to looking at what is underneath that tip of the iceberg. And this is what it's all gonna keep coming back to. Are you solving the right problem? So the, con the, the conceptual model I was referring, referring to is called the levels of conflict. It was, uh, one of a number of people helped to kind of develop this. And it, it basically, it kind of takes the iceberg idea and says that at the, at the top level, if you kind of have a level one human wildlife conflict, you have the visible issue. You know, someone is, you know, some damage has been done. Maybe crops have been raided or uh, livestock have been lost damage. Um, there's a dispute, we call it that. Now, under the surface, there may or may not be more going on. In rare cases, there is actually not much more going on. If that's the situation, you're lucky. That's the simpler one to solve. However, what's going on underneath is shaped usually by history. History usually around past attempts to resolve the issue and attempts that have not gone well quite often. So grievances start building up. Communities or stakeholders are uh, disappointed. And when that goes on and on, it basically festers into becoming more about history that builds up and starts to threaten people in their identity. They feel they have not been heard over and over. And this is where you start to get polarization and division. And this is how you get the kind of very entrenched, intractable wolf style conflict. So how do you know what you're dealing with? I would say those of us working in these areas or projects, you just know intuitively, but you also need a bit of sort of guidance on am I right about this or you're coming into a new area and you actually don't know so what are you looking for well if you're dealing with a fairly simple human wildlife conflict what you're going to hear and I'm saying here because it's a lot about just conversations and listening 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 I really believe that every conservation project should spend a year not doing anything just listening um, and if you're hearing sympathy for the wildlife or you're hearing kind of a willingness to work with you and openness to, to doing collaborating, then you're probably dealing at that sort of level one. If you're hearing frustration, exaggeration of incidences, resentment, you're hearing in the language that 
someone else is to blame. There should be compensation and a lot of skepticism. You know there is something going on underneath that surface, um, that there is an underlying conflict. And if it's worse than that, and you are hearing openly hostile, polarized language, a refusal to cooperate, um, really hostility towards the intentions and skepticism and why are you here, your spy who sent you, and it's all very negative, you're definitely dealing with that sort of level three. And of course, this is a conceptual model, so it's quite simplified, but it, things move between these levels and they may be anywhere along this scale. Now, the problem we have is that if you're at that sort of top level, well, a fence, a chili powder, whatever kind of scaring lights is going to work, yes. Um, and that is what most projects are around the world focusing their efforts on. And that's what they're selling to funders, saying we can fix this because we have a magical repellent. The problem is that the vast majority of human wildlife conflicts certainly are not at that level. They are below the surface. And that isn't going to be fixed with these technical solutions. That needs conflict resolution. So, you know, this is the range, the two extremes of situations that you can encounter. You can have really quite dire seemingly situations where um, a village use, loses everything it has to um, a herd of elephants that's come through and trampled and eaten everything. And yet there isn't, it isn't full of anger and something can be done. And then you have, um, and this is the classic case for, for wolves in North America and many parts of uh, Europe also, uh, just extreme anger. Um, and, and this is expressed, for example, through extreme actions, hostile gestures, like this picture, which um, Jenny also showed in her talk yesterday, which I believe is from a square in Spain. But we have seen this a number of times where, the, where a farmer will uh, put the head of the animal on either the uh, in a public place or worse on the on the steps of the conservation NGO that happened in Germany recently. This is an extreme hostile gesture. We you cannot ignore this. This is shouting at you, saying this is we are not working with you. Okay, so how do we go about this? So I want to spend about five minutes just in a whistle wind. A whirlwind tour of how do you start to break down what you're going to do about this and actually different levels need different strategies but there's a common kind of pattern that is that that functions across all of these all conflict negotiation centers around these three things they look at the issues they look at the relationships and they look at the process in what proportion you do that depends on your level if you are dealing with very deep-rooted difficult issues, process, process, process is everything. And then it's less and less. So, but all of these things uh, come into it at all times. And so if you're dealing with less deep rooted conflicts, anyone if with a bit of negotiation training can help out with the situation. If you are negotiating, you are a party, you are a part of it. You could be the conservation representative or something like that. Um, but if it needs mediation, that has to be done by a third party. It is not going to be you. So if you're dealing in this case of human wildlife conflict with a level one type issue, the focus is going to be finding acceptable solutions together. Okay, it's a focus on practice, practical solutions. Um, and what this is, is actually just applying very basic um, interest-based negotiation. So it is all about what we call reframing in negotiation. So it's figuring out how you keep turning the problem and seeing it differently. And if you're wondering what this image is about, this is a classic thing they teach you in every conflict negotiation course. Is they say, um, turn to your partner and arm wrestle. And everybody who taps down their partner's arm um, gets one point. And if you get one point, you win. So everybody in the room starts arm wrestling like crazy. Um, because they are thinking that they have to force down the other person's arm and then they win. But actually, it wasn't about winning or losing. It was about, well, you could each tap down the other person's arm once, both get one point, and you've done a win-win. We are so used to thinking about win-lose. We, we see that and we immediately think it's going to be win or lose. So reframing absolutely basic, classic conflict negotiation technique used at every level is about turning things and seeing them differently. 
The other absolutely key in all of this is, and this applies to conservation, is um, that the process of the whole thing has to be owned by all the important stakeholders involved. And so this is actually a picture from a fence in Assam uh, where I worked for a long time. And so if you simply put up a fence and you hand it over to the community, that's fine, that's done a lot, but it's not really good enough. What needs to happen, it needs to go beyond just putting up the fence and giving them the responsibility to manage it, which is often done in conservation. It needs to go deeper into actually having them make the decisions about where that fence is gonna go, who's gonna maintain it, how they're gonna manage it. When you do that, whoops, you basically transfer power. That's what's subtly happening here. And by doing that, you create, this is the key to sustainable um, conflict intervention, basically. Okay, if you're dealing with the kind of relationship issues, this is where it may or may not need mediation. What it certainly needs um, is that, it, this is all about letting parties be heard, letting, letting uh, talking about their grievances and getting that out of their systems first before you even talk about solutions. And this is where it can be very useful to use um, external parties, especially if there's a lot of tension. Um, this is all about building or repairing a relationship. Just the entire effort needs to go on that. It's, it's dialogues and meetings over and over until things calm down, until you can start to talk about that solutions level. And one thing that I want to just say as an aside here is that we tend to kind of focus our, um, we, you know, we're, we're pressured into showing progress and impact in our projects, but what we don't do enough is look at the qualitative indicators. What you want to be looking here again is language. You want to see if there's a shift from the language of your elephants have been here again, you are to blame, and whether that is calming and, and lifting up to something more neutral, like the elephants have been here. Can we actually start to use these kinds of indicators a little bit more? So um, the classic kind of method that you would use in this middle range of, of conflicts is, is called interest-based negotiation. It is where you take people who are very fixed or a dialogue that is fixed in positions. We take positions, we say, I'm not gonna agree to this or that you reframe it and you turn it into interests, which is about what you actually need and want. And so a skilled negotiator basically helps the group do exactly that. Now, do you need a facilitator? Do you need a mediator? A facilitator is basically someone who guides the group through that kind of uh, process of discussion and through this classic, what we call groan zone, when you feel like this is impossible, we cannot, I'm sure you've experienced this in workshops and so on, you think, where, how are we gonna get through this? facilitator's job is to navigate that, but they are usually not dealing with extremely tense situations where people are throwing things at each other. If it is much more tense, this is where you bring in a more sophisticated approach, which is mediation. Um, and so at that level three, what we need is a whole nother suite of, suite of efforts, which are around mediation and peace building. This is the kind of situation where you have a really intractable conflict. It's destructive, it's persistent, it seems unsolvable. The views that people have at each other are extreme. There are actual different realities. You know, do you see a duck or a hare in this picture? Um, and it's all about someone coming in completely from the outside um, who is accepted by the parties in that room who will work with both realities and get that dialogue underway. And so one thing you may have heard about is a, an approach called conflict transformation. This is one of a number of peace building approaches that lends itself very nicely to conservation because what it does is it takes the entire uh, system and tries to break patterns. When you have entrenched conflict, there's just patterns that keep repeating themselves and the, the conflict transformation tries to break that apart. And it takes iterations of dialogue. It takes years and years and years um, I'm running a little over time, so I'm going to skip over, although it's such a nice story. But this is all about, uh, you know, a third party helping find a solution that you would have never thought of. Let me, I'm not, can I tell this quick story? 17 camels. This is a parable from the Middle East, and it's used in conflict negotiation training all the time. And I love this one because the story goes that a man had 17 camels and three sons. And he said in his will, 
it said the first son must get half of the camels, the second son must get a third, the third must get a ninth. Now the problem is 17 is a prime number and there's no way to get any whole camels out of this. So an old lady comes along, says, I know what you could do. Here's a camel, just use this, see what you can do. So then they have 18 camels. 18 camels divide nicely. 18 camels divided by half is nine and so on and so forth. And you add them up and you get 17 camels. And the old lady says, thank you very much. Takes her camel back. Problem solved. Now, you would have never come up with this. And I, the, math, the math boggles my mind. But anyway, the point is, the point is you, if you're in a conflict, you can never see this, never, ever. And even the mediator may not see this, but their role is to help find this, to find the, seven, the, the 18th camel. That's the, that story. So where do we go? My argument is that unless we start to, you know, in a normal conflict, you have an escalation and then with intervention, you have a de-escalation. This can take years and years, but that is normally the classic cycle in a high, very simplified way. My argument is that unless we figure out how to do that kind of de-escalation with professionals to help us, we will always keep at an escalated level. And there, there's an argument of cost here. Preventing conflict is not so expensive. Managing it once it's escalated is a little expensive, takes more time. But if we are forever you know, dealing with these festering conflicts that are not being resolved, we cannot afford this. We do not have the resources in conservation to do this. So we better figure out how we bring in peacekeeping professionals or train up some of us ourselves um, to do that. And so my argument is that we need to bring uh, conflict resolution into conservation at scale, urgently, worldwide. We need to teach it in every conservation course. We need to incorporate it into our projects. We need to bring mediators to help us. I've spent the last 20 years working on human wildlife conflict. I'm intending to spend the next 20 working on precisely this. So if you want to join me and talk about these, these ideas, I would love to speak to you. Thank you very much. Time for one question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a question about your conceptual framework. One of the early slides you says it's all about conflicts of interest. I think you're missing one dimension relating to the theme of this conference, values. The difference is that interest, you can solve values. You may end up saying that, well, we have to respect that we have different values. I mean, the whole Conference is about the fact that we live in a world where we have different values about uh, conservation. So, so I, I just want to you, you comment on how do you deal with that aspect that you may, at the end of the day, have people who disagree because they have different values and you, and is there a way to sort of make people not agree, but to sort of respect each other? How, what are the tools for dealing with the value side of this? I yep. think you focused very nicely on all the interest side, but I missed a bit the value side of this equation. Yeah, no, I, I was, um, I think I also touched on values, um, certainly everything around identities, beliefs, values at that lower level, that is what it's all about. Um, and of course, in a system of coexistence, which is the, the ideal that we strive towards, is a world where different stakeholder groups respect each other's values and beliefs and identities, and they don't go to war with each other about it. Um, and the way to get there is through peace building approaches, basically, if it's gone wrong, or or just starting at a more uh, at a better place in the first place, prevention. No, we're not doing any conflict prevention. Basically, we're only jumping in when there's a crisis. But yes, it it is all about values, of course. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Uh, very informative and and uh, useful conversation uh that i think will will probably be discussed uh, some of your ideas uh and how they can be incorporated i really like the idea of taking the biological sciences uh the social sciences and then adding the conflict resolution to try and build that model out so uh, again thank you very much for for making the effort to come over and, and speak to us uh, our next speaker this morning is dr ashley dayer uh, Dr. Dayer is an associate professor at the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Conservation at Virginia Tech. Uh, 
and she is also the social science advisor for the National Audubon Society. Her research program focuses on understanding people's and organizations' conservation behavior, especially related to bird conservation, private land habitat conservation, human wildlife conflict, endangered species management, and citizen science. As part of this research, she explores the role that policy tools and educational interventions can play in influencing behavior. Much of our current research is part of interdisciplinary teams and focused on bridging the implementation gap between science and conservation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ashley Dayer for her talk titled, Agencies Can Make New Friends, But Keep the Old Through Wildlife Viewing. All right, great to see you all here. <clears throat> what Dean didn't tell you is I'm actually a CSU alum. 20 years ago, I started here as a master's student, so it's really fun to be back here co-hosting the conference and also sharing with you a bit more about my research. So originally, I um, well, I guess I should say I'm going to start with a little story and then I'm going to move into some research insights. So originally, my work was related to wildlife values and the public. I studied the, the Western public for my master's research. Um, but by the time I did my postdoc, I'd moved into studying wildlife viewers, and I've been doing so for about 10 years. Um, and this work began when I was at Cornell. Um, viewers were a really familiar subject for me. Uh, I had before my HD degrees and after my HD degrees worked as an environmental educator for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Klamath Bird Observatory. And much of the program I did was focused on wildlife viewing. And I spent my time doing that programming, really trying to integrate conservation messaging with the goal that I would hopefully change the conservation behaviors of wildlife viewers as well, both young and old. Um, and additionally, from my involvement in bird conservation jobs, which began when I first worked in Hawaii, I guess nearly 25 years ago, I was aware that there was a need to engage wildlife viewers in supporting conservation, as the funding was inadequate for our conservation work, and viewers seemed to be a really key constituency that hadn't been fully tapped for uh, supporting conservation. Yet arguably my interest in wildlife viewing began in this backyard where I grew up and my mom was an avid bird feeder. We might say truly obsessed with bird feeding. In my youth, I related to viewing a lot more than I related to any other wildlife related recreation. While I fished for bluegill in this pond, I was never really into it. And I always threw back in the bluegill as soon as I would catch them. At this same pond, I'd learned to fear hunting. A formative memory of mine is walking around the neighbor's pond as a kid, enjoying the wildlife, only to hear gunshots overhead, jump behind the cattails and quiver. It only happened once, but I still remember it vividly. Based on these personal and professional experiences, I believed like many of my colleagues that there was a really clear line in the sand between viewers, birders, what we might call, I know it's flawed, non-consumptive recreationists, and then hunters and anglers, or, or we, might, we might call consumptive recreationists, again, with some flaws to that term. The latter group being typically the key supporters and beneficiaries of state agencies, except for a state like Missouri, as Sarah Parker Polly shared with us yesterday. And this perception of the line in the sand was perpetuated even more when I heard of conflicts between hunters and viewers over access to lands like in North Carolina, where my parents are now birders, and I have collaborators who work at North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And on the other side, I was very aware of the bad rap I heard about birders not wanting to contribute to conservation funding. Many a comment from my agency colleagues frustrated by the lack of funding support from the largest proportion of the wildlife viewing and or sorry wildlife loving public. Yet when I began doing my social science research related to wildlife viewers, I learned that this line in the sand was not as stark as I had envisioned. And with each individual study I have led uh, since then, 
I've, I've realized more and more that uh, wildlife viewers and, and uh, hunters not, aren't necessarily so different. Uh, the song in my head, um, it gets louder and louder. So I was a Girl Scout in the 80s and we sang this song around the campfire. Anybody know it? Okay. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other gold. It sounded better this morning. Um, <clears throat> so that plays over and over in my head. Before I launch into sharing my research and why it is that I think about this song all the time, I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about what wildlife viewing is. So the definition that we use comes from the National Survey of Hunting, Fishing, and Wildlife Related Recreation. It's closely observing, feeding, and photographing wildlife, visiting parks and natural areas for the primary purpose of viewing wildlife, and improving or managing wildlife habitat. As I started doing research in this area, I was also aware of the trends from the National Survey, well aware of the enormous popularity of wildlife viewing in the U.S. and elsewhere and particularly that viewing around the home, and also aware of the upward trend in wildlife viewing. What we didn't know as well, beyond the participation and expenditures, how did hunters and viewers different? So one of the key questions we were interested in initially is who engages more in conservation, hunters or viewers? So along with Karen Cooper, Lincoln Larson and others, Based on a survey in New York State, we dove into this issue, heading right for that line in the sand. And what we found out right away is that that line is a lot blurrier than I originally imagined. People aren't all on one side or the other. And really importantly, people most engaged in conservation, here we call them the hunter bird watcher, cross the line. So you can see here that they are really our conservation superstars. My PhD student, Bennett Grooms, and I and our colleagues expanded on this work in Virginia with research uh, supported by the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And we added anglers and general wildlife viewers beyond just the birders to the mix, yet still finding that same thing. Conservation superstars were the folks who were engaged in hunting, angling, viewing, and bird watching. So my answer to this question about who engages more in conservation, hunters, anglers, birders, or viewers, it's those who are involved in all of those activities. They are most likely to be our conservation superstars. So we've moved on to addressing this next question. Are viewers connected to their agency and benefiting from the programming of the agency? Uh, with the support of a multi-state grant, thanks to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and in collaboration with the Wildlife Viewing and Nature Tourism Working Group of AFWA, we've been able to conduct a survey at the national, regional, and state level, but I won't be showing those results, of wildlife viewers. And this was an opt-in panel survey with over 4,000 participants at the national and regional level. Again, we found a great deal of overlap between viewing, which included birding in this study, and fishing and hunting to the tune of 46% of individuals reporting that they are involved in both. What I wanna point out is that this group of people who are only birders and viewers are probably what I would hypothesize are, are mutualists, although we didn't ask that specifically. In this study, we were able to dig in more to understand um, more than conservation behavior differences. And we consistently found that consumptive viewers had a stronger connection to agencies. Not surprising, right? And that came through in things such as more familiarity or more trust. They also were more, uh, were benefiting more likely from the types of programming that agencies offered. They were reporting their engagement in many programs that are beneficial to viewers, while non-consumptive viewers were not as likely to be involved in those programs and probably not aware of them either. So this question of are viewers connected to their agency and benefiting from the program, the answer is more so if they also hunt and fish. 
So we've moved on to looking at this question of how can agencies ensure that viewing programs also benefit consumptive viewers. So while we found a lot of similarities in what consumptive and non-consumptive viewers want from their agency in terms of viewing programming, such as information, access, and programming, the same old approach, reaching out to the same old type of constituents is not necessarily going to get that new group of viewers that the agency has not been as involved with. Based on our research, we know that programming also needs to be in urban areas. It needs to be appropriate for the majority of viewers to report being the beginner or novice viewers. And it needs to be inclusive of marginalized groups, such as Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are underrepresented in viewing compared to their proportion of the entire US population, and viewers with disabilities who make up one third of viewers and have more barriers to viewing than any of the other types of viewers. This can be best accomplished in collaboration with viewing and also community groups and led by people who look like these viewers. So again, how can agencies ensure viewing programs will also benefit non-consumptive viewers? They need to be designed to be relevant to the full range of viewers, not just the viewers that are already served by the agency in other ways. So the other thing I wanna point out, and this has been brought to my attention again and again as we've done this work in wildlife viewing, is that wildlife viewing programs can get agencies there, can increase the relevancy, but they need staffing, they need resources, and they need leadership support. We're working currently with a community of practice of about 20 state agencies, again, through support of another phase of multi-state funding. And in surveying those uh, agencies, we found that the majority of them have one, two, or three staff for wildlife viewing, yet one third of the U.S. population participates in wildlife viewing. I know agencies are strapped for resources, so the question becomes then, who is going to pay for this? So as I mentioned before, I'm well aware of the bad rap that non-consumptive viewers do not contribute to agencies. If we look at the pay to play mechanisms that exist for many state agencies, not surprisingly, we see that the viewers who are contributing the most are the consumptive viewers. But that's likely because they're going to benefit from these things or they're required to pay in those sorts of ways. Of course, the land access fee or the fees for programs and events may be appropriate, but I ask, are the, the non-consumptive viewers aware of these opportunities or do they think it's something that they want to do? Likewise, we have voluntary mechanisms that people can give to state agencies. And you'll see across the board, not surprising to you all as well, I'm sure there's a lot less contribution to these mechanisms than the pay to play type mechanisms. But again, we see that the consumptive viewers are giving more, the non-consumptive viewers are giving less to those mechanisms. So why is this going on? I want you to pause for a moment and reflect. How do you decide which organizations you wish to financially support? I would suspect that the answer that coming to your head are things that you feel like are important, valuable, people like you, people who share your values, things that you might benefit from or are really important connections to you. They're not organizations that you don't know much about. They're not organizations that you feel serve a different group of people. They're not organizations that are just gonna give you a really cool gift. You give to organizations that you care about. Birders are giving money. We found out through the um, North American Waterfowl Management Plan surveys of viewers. Here we surveyed um, thousands, tens of thousands of eBird registrants, which is a participatory science project through Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And we found that birders were donating money, 60% to bird watching and related issues, 56% to the conservation of other birds, 37% said to wetland or waterfowl conservation. 
and only 9% said to waterfowl hunting and hunting related recreation. I would suspect those are the folks who are also in view, involved in hunting or maybe have received some of the messaging related to the benefits of the duck stamp or something along those lines. So they're giving money to the organizations that they see are organizations serving them and the issues that they see are serving them as well. When we uh, conducted the national survey, we also asked people, how likely would you be to provide more financial support than you currently do to your state agency if your contributions were used in the following way? And we saw across the board here, whoops, we saw across the board here that more than 50% were willing to give more to their state agency for all of these reasons. But we've learned in focus groups that people believe that if they give money to the state agency, it's, and I should say, non-consumptive viewers believe if they give money to the agency, it's gonna go to a general fund or it's gonna go to benefit game related activities, which is what they see are most commonly coming out of their agency. So they don't believe that it's going to actually go to the things that they care about. So thinking back to why you give money to an organization, there's a disconnect here. In Virginia, we conducted focus groups, and I really like this focus group quote. It says, if the DWR was sending me a report that says the money we collected from the fee that you paid to be a bird watcher helped enhance or improve 25 acres or something like that, that would be really motivating. I would know that after, I would know that year after year that progress was being made with that money. So people not only want to think that their money is going to something valuable, but they want to see the tangible results. They want to hear back from you that, yes, this is leading to things that I care about. And Virginia has been using these results for their Restore the Wild program, which is a pretty cool opportunity for them to connect with wildlife viewers and ask those wildlife viewers for support that then goes to habitat restoration projects that viewers can actually see the accomplishments of and hear back about the accomplishments that have been accomplished from them. <clears throat> One last piece that I wanted to mention that we've been able to see in our research again in Virginia is that familiarity with the agency and also your income level leads to greater likelihood of contributions uh, through voluntary contribution mechanisms. So again, if you don't know your agency, you don't think that they do anything for you, people are not going to give funding. But the reverse is true. As more familiarity grows, you will be able to see more connections to funding mechanisms. So again, my answer to this question, who is going to pay for this? People who feel that the agency is relevant to them and here's the key piece that I see is really missing right now in the conservation conversation with state agencies. Also people that believe they are relevant to the agency. It's not just about your relevance to them, it's about them feeling that they are relevant to you. So they need to see that your agency truly cares about them and truly is interested in serving them before they're gonna start having any interest in giving you money. So probably some of you are sitting there saying, that's great, but then I'm gonna have a lot of really mad people banging on my door because I'm starting to do things for wildlife viewers. So I wanna address this issue of, will there be an outcry from hunters and anglers if agencies develop programming for viewers? And I'm gonna do it based on a case study that we had in Virginia. We conducted a survey of wildlife viewers, hunters, anglers, and birders in Virginia, as I mentioned. And then when we worked through a stakeholder engagement process with state agency staff, as well as agencies and organizations that work with wildlife viewers, either in part or fully, we developed a plan. And in that planning process, we presented several times to the board, the DWR board, no one ever showed up to complain about that planning process. The board of the agency unanimously voted in support of the viewing plan. When we had a public comment period that we advertised extensively across the country, or across the state, we heard back from 350 people. 172 of the 350 comments were just overall support for the plan. 
only 28 comments out of 357 were negative about the plan. And less than 5% of them related to people complaining about how they felt that it was problematic the agency was going to be serving viewers rather than hunters and anglers. Even though we pointed out throughout the plan, it wasn't an or, it was an and. So based on this experience in Virginia, I know that there's still a lot of fear, but I believe that there will not necessarily be an outcry if your agency starts doing more for wildlife viewers. And if there is, please don't tell me. <clears throat> so uh, again, while I'm well aware that your resources are finite, I hope that today's presentation really points out that agencies can make new friends and keep the old through focusing more on viewing programs and projects. Not only will your old friends benefit, as well as their children, which many of them brought up in their comments, but the agency will be more relevant to a broader group of people. And that group of people will feel like they're relevant to you too. Thank you. I'm curious if it's come up in any conversations, like when it's more of the theoretical plan versus when the programming's actually on the ground, particularly if there's spatial overlap, was there any concern with like the agency staff that you were working with, with like, okay, there doesn't seem to be any red flag conflicts, but once we actually start implementing, there could be conflicts. I'm just curious if any of those themes came up in your work. I have not heard about that, but a great person to ask are the folks from Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, and they're going to be presenting in a session that we're going to have this morning because um, they are fully in the implementation phase right now of their wildlife viewing plan. Yep. Thanks for your presentation. Um, we're having the same conversation in Kansas, and I really appreciate your graph about the, the highest category of folks that that would be likely to contribute were those that knew their funds would be matched, right? So of course that leads us state agencies to say, would you buy a license, right? So have you got any information on uh, the best way to help educate people about the broad value of those contributions to habitat improvement? Because um, that's that's when we talk to folks, um, birders. They say, well, I'm not interested in supporting hunting. I want to support habitat. And so we're trying to figure out how to communicate that. I don't have great news for you. Um, so uh, I, I totally understand. I've seen the communications come out from Audubon, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, other bird related organi birding related organizations, you might argue, or non-game bird organizations, trying to push people to buy the duck stamp. Um, when, when we studied the eBird registrants through the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, um, a survey, we found that folks who um, were asked, would you buy the duck stamp in the future if you knew that it benefited either hunting or bird conservation? It was still super low percentages, 85% of them said, I will still not buy that duck stamp. Um, so I think this gets at one of these intractable sort of situations where it's so, um, so ingrained in people that I'm not gonna be counted myself. I'm just gonna be thought of as a hunter. And I don't want this to be seen as more hunting related support and go towards hunting. I would really encourage, and I know this is hard to find a way to match, although Rawa, um, find a way to, to match funds that seems like a specific mechanism for birders and viewers where they can actually say like, that's us, we know that's us. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, it's working. It's working now. <laughs> oh, it's working now. Good. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your presentation. 
Um, uh, speak, getting to that direct funding mechanism by non-consumptive viewers, um, there's been a lot of discussions about taxing backpacks and skis and hiking boots and what have you, mountain bikes, uh, and then that money going to the state DNRs. Um, have you had experience with that or, or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't had experience with it. I was not involved in the teaming with wildlife stuff, but aware of, of what occurred during that time. I will say that the state agencies who have had success with it, like Virginia or Missouri, it's a proportion of the existing wildlife, uh, existing sales tax. And such as in Virginia, it's calculated based upon the numbers from the national survey and how much is expected to be spent by that group of people. So it's not an extra tax on top of it. Um, so uh, that's that's all I can tell you along those lines. Um, but I know getting a, a chunk of a pie that's already finite is is very challenging. Um, thank you. Um, it's kind of like a twofold question. Uh, one, um, did you include hikers in your non-consumptive? And uh, if you didn't, why? Because uh, I'm curious because during COVID, something that we saw is a huge amount of people start going out. They are not going to see anything. They just want to be out, enjoy nature. And by numbers is way larger because hikers, they go out almost every day. Uh, birders will go every weekend or one or two times a day. Uh, what is your take on that? Yeah, great point. In a lot of our surveys, we have looked at overlap of hiking and wildlife viewing, and you do see overlap there. I'm a hiker myself. I know that that often gets me outside a lot more than a slow walk with binoculars. Um, we were specifically interested, though, in looking at wildlife viewing because we the agencies were interested in that connection with wildlife. When we did the work in, in Virginia, it's because wildlife viewers are one of their five groups that they are supposed to be focusing on. Um, I agree with you, though, that there's a lot of potential with other types of recreationists who enjoy the outdoors as well. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, this might be a question for both you and Alex, depending, but I want to ask about that under 5%. Who, who submitted those comments. Um, I work in Washington state where we have really strong issues, um, you know, between consumptive and non-consumptive users. And, you know, what we tend to default to as wildlife advocates or, you know, in our arguments to legislatures is majority rules. Like look at the number of comments or look at the number of people. And that's, it just seems to be the most persuasive argument, but being steamrolled like that, just makes people more angry. <laughs> and it only takes a couple of them to issue death threats to commissioners. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, you know, what, what's the next role in dealing with that? Yeah, so there were no death threats and none of them showed up at meetings. So I, I don't think they were steamrolled, but you'll notice that, that that table that I showed you was where we really clearly identified and it's in the back of the plan, how the plan was adjusted based on every single type of feedback that we received. It was a ton of work from my research scientist at the time, but it was 18 pages that are in there where she went through every theme of the type of feedback and then clearly mapped out how the plan was adjusted so that it wasn't just like, I'm sorry, we don't care about you, but we actually said, yes, we're taking everyone's feedback into consideration and making adjustments based upon that. Did you or have you seen anyone compare when the state agency includes parks or is just wildlife? Yeah, that's a, a great point. We have not yet done any analysis based upon our national and regional surveys to look at differences at the state level. We'd love to do that. We've, we've talked about doing things where we might look at the level of um, investment in and viewing programs, or like you're saying, state parks as part of the agency as well, um, at, or whether or not they have a birding trail and wildlife viewing trail. So, so indicators that there's more investment or there's types of programs that might be more of interest to those types of, of viewers. Um, and we have not looked at that yet. I will say in general, we've, we did 16 state level reports. There weren't a lot of differences among the states. 
Um, and a lot of the patterns held like, yes, you know, like percentages were, were different, uh, but it is something we'd like to look at more. Well, that wraps up the plenary for this morning. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking both Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Dayer for their uh, contributions to uh, the plenary this morning.